Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the fifth episode of I Saw a Bird, Audubon's Spring Migration Show. My name is David Ringer. I work with Audubon in New York City. Uh, it's just after 7 o'clock here on the East Coast, and you may be able to hear out my window the cheers for first responders and medical personnel um, that go up around the city every night. So to all of those folks, thank you for what you're doing, keeping us safe. Uh, so I saw a bird today, uh, one of my favorite summertime birds. It was a chimney swift. And I'm just going to share a little article here while we're talking. So chimney swifts spend most of their life on the wing, catching insects in the air. Um, and this is a bird that people can help by putting up towers that chimney swifts nest in. Um, this is actually an example from Alabama, where one of our uh, college partners worked with Alabama Audubon to um, put up a chimney swift tower. So that was a great reminder of some summertime and the ways that people could help birds today. How about you, Christine? Yeah, that's a super cool bird, David. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Christine from Audubon. And it is just past six in the central flyway. And I've been seeing a lot of great egrets lately, which is really cool because it also happens to be Audubon's logo. So I take it as a pretty good sign. Yeah, beautiful bird and Audubon's logo for well over a century. So we've got a really fantastic show tonight planned. Um, Ken Kaufman is here. We're super excited. Uh, so get your sightings and your questions going in the chat. We're going to have plenty of time for Q&A with Ken, our bird expert extraordinaire. We're going to focus on the Audubon mural project tonight, which is bringing gorgeous bird art to Harlem, New York. We have some of the artists with us. Uh, we're also going to hear about Wingspan, which is a really, really neat new app that helps you experience birds wherever you are. So as always, remember to share your sightings with hashtag I saw a bird on all your favorite social media and keep your questions and sightings coming in the chat as we go, because we'll take plenty of time to hear from you tonight. So with that, we are very honored to introduce Ken Kaufman, a special guest who's joining us back on the show tonight. Ken is a field guide, author, an artist, a conservationist. He's a preeminent bird expert and a field editor for Audubon Magazine. Uh, we know many of you know him. Every time he's on, we see lots of comments from people who are big fans of Ken, as we are too. So we're going to ask you, Ken, a few of our migration questions while we build up a supply of questions from our viewers, uh, and then we'll turn to some of those. Okay, great. Well, it's good to see you, David. You too. So, Ken, uh, you're in Ohio. You've got lots of migration going on. What migratory birds are you seeing these days? <laughs> Well, yeah, today, uh, today I saw the same uh, migratory birds that I saw yesterday. Um, <laughs> you know, as you know, um, uh, a lot of these small songbirds uh, migrate at night and they, they don't fly every night. So they wait for a condition where it's, uh, where it's the right conditions. Um, good, good flying conditions, clear skies, winds blowing in the direction they want to go. And here we've had sort of chilly weather and north winds the last few days. So uh, the birds that came in three or four days ago are still here. Fortunately, those birds are like Baltimore Orioles and Orchard Orioles. And so we've got these incredible, beautiful birds uh, out in the backyard. And um, the Orioles are just, just so amazing. You know, they could function they could function as bug eating birds without having such bright colors. So the fact that they have such incredible colors, you know, to me, it feels like a real blessing for us. Yeah, they are really gorgeous. I saw a few uh, around my neighborhood this weekend as well, which uh, is maybe a segue to our next uh, activity here. So I know that a lot of people are seeing a lot of new birds. You know, as you mentioned, some days when the south winds blow, the birds we see around us are different than the ones we saw before. Um, and sometimes they take a lot of work to figure out what they are. So we're going to play a little game here where we show a warbler from a little bit of an odd angle where some of its most identifying features are not visible. We're going to uh, ask you what are some of the things people should look for. And then while we're doing that, we're hoping that all of you, our viewers, will be putting your guesses about this bird's identification in the comments. So once Ken has given us a few pointers, we'll read a few of your answers, and then we'll reveal a picture um, that shows what the bird is. So these are both birds that I saw here in New York City over the weekend, which was beautiful, lots of migration going on. 
Let's take a look at the first one. So get your comments going in the question and answer. What do you think this is? Ken, what should people be looking for in this image? Oh boy, well that's, you know, it's uh, being a warbler, we can see more of it than we usually can. <laughs> Warblers are such fun, you know, flitting around in the trees, hiding behind leaves, tiny birds. You know, of course, it's hard to see the, uh, you know, the size, but you can see it's got really small, delicate feet. So, you know, this is a, it's a small bird and um, not that much uh, in the way of markings visible uh, on this uh, particular bird. When we're looking at warblers, often we're looking at the face pattern and at the wing pattern. And of course, the, you know, the face pattern is not showing up here. Um, but as I look at it, something that really catches my eye is that patch of yellow um, on, the, on the side, uh, right on the side of the chest. There, there's like a discrete patch of yellow there that isn't connected to anything else. And that, um, you know, that, that's really, um, really a good clue. Um, yes. Um, well, thanks for that. So it looks like we have some guesses coming in. Jessica suggests Canada Warbler. Um, and whoops, sorry about that. Looks like we had a little screen difficulty there. Um, hopefully everybody can see the bird fully now. So um, Jessica is suggesting Canada Warbler. Um, let's go ahead and go to the reveal. I can, there we go. So there's the reveal. There's the bird that a lot of people might recognize. Yeah, so there you can see the, the face pattern I was talking about with the, that nice black mask and the white throat. And it becomes much more clear that this is a yellow rump warbler of the Eastern population, uh, often called myrtle warbler. Um, the, the yellow rump warbler also includes the Western Audubons, which has yellow on the throat and a slightly different face pattern. But this is a nice uh, adult male uh, myrtle yellow rump warbler. Yes. All right. Let's go to the next one here. Oh, boy. So as, <laughs> as, as you're pointing yeah. out some features, Ken, keep the comments going in the question and answer box. Classic pose. Now, um, a lot of warblers would be almost impossible from this angle, if we, <laughs> which unfortunately, this is an angle that we see a lot. But uh, we would look yes. at the, the underside of the tail because the majority of the warblers have some sort of white uh, on the underside of the tail feathers and uh, the pattern of that can be helpful. Um, but with, with this bird, we can also see that it's got black stripes coming back along the, the flanks and especially those undertail coverts, those pointed uh, feathers that stick uh, back under the base of the tail. They're white with black sort of spear points on them. And that is a real clue for this bird because this species uh, has that uh, and none of the other North American warblers do. Excellent. Well, we have a couple of guesses here. Looks like somebody's on the right track. So Debbie suggests pine warbler, John suggests chickadee, and Robin suggests black and white warbler. So let's do the reveal. There and we there go. It is. <laughs> yeah. Nice, yeah, that's, it's a nice, uh, again, an adult male of the black and white warbler. And uh, if we were watching this uh, for a while, or moving around, we'd probably be able to recognize it even just by, by silhouette because it creeps around on the trees. Uh, John James Audubon, 200 years ago, called it the black and white creeper. But we know, we know it's a member of the warbler family, but uh, beautiful black and white stripes on it. And even without any bright colors at all, it's really a gorgeous bird. It really is. Uh, I have a couple of friends who love this bird because they say you can identify it even without binoculars by that behavior you were talking about. Exactly, Great. yeah, well, thank yeah you. wonderful bird. Yeah. Thanks for that your guesses, fun. everybody. And thank you for sharing your photos. Where were you when you took those photos, David? So I was at the Hudson River Park, which is along the west side of Manhattan and has a lot of nice little uh, edge habitat where a lot of warblers drop in during migration. Um, so speaking of migration, since that is a topic, Ken, I have another question for you. So every spring we get a lot of people on social media asking, when will I see hummingbirds? So could you tell us a little bit about hummingbird migration routes? And also as a reminder for the viewers out here, um, remember to leave your question in the comments below whenever you have something to ask us. Yeah, um, well, hummingbirds are so popular and, and rightly so. It's, it's amazing that they exist at all. 
Oh, just that each, each one seems like a little miracle. Um, and their migration patterns are really interesting and varied. Uh, out west, um, in the southwest, there are some uh, hummingbirds that migrate east and west instead of sort of the north and south. So for example, Anna's hummingbird and Costa's hummingbird will migrate from California east into Arizona and then back west again. Uh, Rufus hummingbirds spending the winter in southern Mexico will start northwestward in late winter. Then in February, they're moving northwest through the deserts along the coast uh, up to breeding grounds as far north as Alaska. But then by the middle of summer, those Rufus hummingbirds are already moving southeastward uh, toward the Rockies. So they, their calendar is messed up and their directions are messed up. In eastern North America, there's only the one uh, widespread uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. And it's in, in a lot of ways, it's the most fascinating of all because it, you know, it doesn't really turn the calendar on its head. But on the way north, these ruby-throated hummingbirds have been wintering down in deep southern Mexico and down in Central America. They'll come north onto the Yucatan Peninsula and then they'll fly north across the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, this is a tiny bird weighing like a tenth of an ounce. And it's amazing that it stays alive at all. It has to be feeding constantly, but somehow it's able to fly for 18 hours across the water, going across the Gulf of Mexico and winding up on the Gulf Coast. And that's, so every, you know, when we see these birds coming north again, the fact that they've survived just seems like a miracle. It's, it's a wonderful story. Yeah, for sure. It really is. I remember standing on the on a beach along the Gulf Coast in Louisiana doing a bird survey for Audubon several years ago. It was in the fall. We saw a little ruby-throated hummingbird fly overhead and it just shot out over the open water of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and I knew it wasn't gonna stop until it reached the Yucatan Peninsula. And I almost get tears thinking about that memory of that tiny fragile little body just shooting out into the sky. It's amazing. It really is extraordinary. They're just the, they're amazing birds and they're, they're arriving right now uh, in the upper Midwest and in the Northeast. This is the time when they're showing up. So if you have chilly days, if you have a place where if your flowers aren't going, your, your garden full of native flowers, if it's not really going well yet, it's a good time to put out a hummingbird feeder because uh, they, they may be showing up, they may be hungry, uh, especially on these cold days. Yeah. Well, let's turn to some viewer questions. And we want to remind everybody that Ken writes an Ask Ken column on Audubon.org. So we'll drop a link to that column in the chat. Uh, but let's turn to some questions. Christine, I think we've got one teed up for you. Yeah, so we have a question from Kevin. Um, is there evidence that migration times are becoming earlier? That, yeah, that's a really good point. And there, there is evidence of that in a number of places. You know, migration is not, um, it's not uniform, but a number of places where there have been long-term studies uh, in Europe, mainly in Europe and in Northeastern North America, there's data going back far enough where we can actually see that uh, the timing of bird migration is moving up um, for at least some species. They're, they're coming back in spring a week to 10 days earlier than they did historically. And, you know, in a way, it's good to know they've got that ability to adapt. And uh, can Catherine wants to know how long does spring migration generally last? Yeah, one of the one of the wonderful things about migration is that it's going on for a, a good percentage of the year. Um, just well, to give an example from here, and I live in northern Ohio, and here the first migration, the first stirrings of migration start up by the middle of February. There are a few things already moving in, the killdeers and crows and eagles are already starting to move north, and it builds up through March, through April. There's a big peak in May, but then there's still some migrants coming through like the first week of June, uh, including some of the shorebirds headed to the Arctic tundra. So. The, the spring migration is going on for well over three, three months. And then the fall migration lasts like five months. So there, there are birds migrating most of the time. Yeah, that's a lot of travel. It really <laughs> um, is. So, yeah, we have another question from Laura who says, my son is wondering if birds decide um, to, to migrate in groups. You know, that's a really good point. Um, there are some kinds of birds that, that migrate in flocks. They're very sociable and they'll, they'll migrate together. That's true of, uh, for example, um, geese and swans and cranes. They're, they're very sociable in migration. 
uh, swallows, um, various kinds of birds that migrate in the daytime, like blackbirds will migrate in flocks. The, um, the birds that migrate at night tend to be going more as individuals and, and navigating on their own. So there may be a lot of them traveling at the same time and traveling in the same direction, but they're not necessarily in a flock. So it's, um, it's different with different kinds of birds. So Ken, Todd wants to know, uh, you were mentioning a moment ago, chilly weather. Uh, I think a lot of people across the country are experiencing that. And uh, so Todd says that uh, Todd lives in Alabama and is currently sitting outside with wind gusting to 25 miles an hour and temperatures falling into the low 40s tonight. My daughter who lives outside Cincinnati says it may snow there. How do these weather conditions affect migration and will it stall the birds? Yeah, that's a good point. And in fact, it will. Um, you know, the overall timing of migration is pretty much the same from year to year uh, in a general way, but it can vary by a week or more um, depending on, on what the weather conditions are doing. So they're, especially the smaller birds, are very sensitive to what's going on and they'll wait for the good conditions. And so having cold weather like that come in, um, as for someone on down on the Gulf Coast or in the Gulf Coast states, um, those birds that have come in, they've, they've flown in from Yucatan, and it's not just hummingbirds, it's all kinds of things, they're going to stick around for a while. So um, in a way, if you're, if you're in Alabama or Georgia, someplace in the south, that's good news because the birds will stay longer, you get to enjoy them uh, longer. For those of us who are sitting up in the upper Midwest and waiting, uh, we may have to be patient for a while. So we're getting a lot of good questions from our audience. Someone named Ashley wants to know, does human activity affect bird migration patterns at all? Uh, yeah, human, human activity does have an impact on, on migration patterns um, in, in some ways. One thing that's really notable is the way that having bright lights in tall city buildings can have a real negative impact on migratory birds. There's been a movement in recent years to get, um, get the cities to turn off the lights and the tall buildings uh, downtown at night on big migration nights. Uh, it's, it's called the lights out movement, which has sort of a negative connotation maybe, but it really, it really helps the birds to get by because they're, they're flying at night, they're navigating by the stars, and having big lights in the, in the windows of these skyscrapers can be really confusing. So uh, I know uh, in a number of cities, for example, in Toledo, Ohio here, um, the, uh, the city leaders have been responsive to the idea of dimming the lights downtown during the peak of migration. And we feel like it's going to help more of the birds get through. Yeah, that's an important strategy in a lot of places and many Audubon chapters and other organizations are leading the charge in, in those efforts in different cities around the country. Um, so Ken, Joanne wants to know how fast birds can fly. Yeah, um, the, there's a lot of variation in that and it's, it's sort of hard to, to measure, you know, because, um, you know, unless you get birds into a wind tunnel and, and time them there, um, the, the peregrine falcon, um, you know, our, our friend uh, Jason Ward, uh, his favorite bird is the peregrine falcon, partly because it's the fastest flying bird in the world. And when it's diving on prey, it can hit 200 miles an hour or more. Uh, most birds in level flight can't get anywhere near that, but some of the swifts, um, like the chimney swift that you mentioned, David, uh, some of the swifts are thought to be able to get up close to 100 miles an hour in level flight. Um, for Amazing. most migratory birds, uh, most of these small birds, you know, if they're going 30 miles an hour, maybe 40 miles an hour for some of the shore birds in migration, that's a pretty respectable cruising speed. I'm yeah, I've, I've had the opportunity to see a, a peregrine falcon dive in person and it's such a cool thing to see. It really just like gives you an adrenaline rush to see how fast they dive towards the ground. Mm -hmm. it, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. it's, so we have another question. It is, do birds return to the same nests each year or do they build new ones? That's, and, and again, um, <laughs> the, the, it varies with the species. Most kinds of birds will build a new nest every time. Um, 
something like a, like a hummingbird, for example, their nest is an amazing little marvel of, of construction, but uh, it has to stretch as the young birds uh, grow. So uh, once they've used the nest once, it's not so good for a second time. So most kinds of birds will build a new nest every time. Um, some things like eagles uh, will just keep adding sticks to the same nest year after year, and an eagle nest might be used for decades and might become huge. Um, but that's, uh, that's sort of unusual, and that tends to happen with the, just a few of the larger birds. Yeah, and what's so amazing about those hummingbird nests, the reason they can stretch, right, is because they're made with individual strands of spider silk. So it's that's soft right. and stretchy as those babies grow. That's right, amazing. yeah. So it's, it's important to, uh, to encourage spiders, you know, in your yard and in your garden if you want to have hummingbirds around. Who would have thought? <laughs> uh, so Ken Lynn asks, what are the signals that are the cues for birds to migrate? Is it length of day, temperature, or other factors? For, um, well, that, that's still an area of research, but for most kinds of birds, we think it has to do with, uh, with the day length. Uh, they're, they're very sensitive to the, uh, what's called the photo period, the, the time, the length of the day from sunrise to sunset. Um, they're very much tuned into that for judging the season. So that seems to be what, what sets them off. They're not like waiting for a change in weather in most cases. Um, you know, a lot of our summer birds, they'll leave in late summer when it's still beautiful weather and there's still plenty to eat and they just, you know, they just take off and go. And it's, it's based on the fact that the days are starting to get shorter. So that's, uh, that's an oversimplified answer, but that's one of the main clues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one person named Joanne wants to know, do birds eat at all during migration? Um, yeah, they do. Um, the, in fact, that's an important part of their migration. There, there are very few birds that make their migration in just one, um, one flight. Um, most kinds, they'll, they'll fly a short distance and then they'll stop uh, for several days. And so they need stopover habitat along the way where they can stop and feed. So. Uh, Something like a warbler, um, it, may, um, it may eat so much that it will double its weight or almost double its weight before it starts its migration. So you go from a little less than half an ounce to a little less than an ounce, you know, that's, but it's, you know, it's a big change for them, but they can, they can burn off most of that fat in, in just a long night's flight. So then they have to stop and, and feed again. Um, so, for, for most kinds of birds, the migration is just a series of stages uh, between the, uh, the wintering grounds and the breeding grounds, and uh, it, it'll take them quite a while to get there. And, and feeding and good stopover habitat on the way is a really important part of that. Yeah, that's a really good point. So that's it for all our viewer questions. Thank you, everybody, for submitting them. We've gotten so many good questions today. And now I want to move on to a book that you published last year. It's titled A Season on the Wind. And in that book, you talk a lot about the birds that you've observed in your own backyard, which is really timely because you know, right now, a lot of us are able to enjoy the wildlife that we see outside our own windows. So if you were talking to someone who's a first time birder, what kinds of tips would you give them? If they're just trying to ID some birds near their homes. Well, if you're, if you're just getting started with, um, with learning to identify birds, um, it's, um, it's hard to summarize in a few words, but looking at things like size and shape and uh, trying to break them down to groups is really important. Getting the, the Audubon app uh, for your phone, you know, it's free. And that will help, you can, you can key in where you are and it will narrow it down to just the birds that are most likely in the spot where you are. Um, so that's, that's something I really recommend. Don't, don't try to figure out, you know, it's one of 10,500 kinds of birds in the world. Uh, if you can get it down to, um, you know, just the 40 or 50 that are most likely in your yard, that makes it much more simple. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself a beginner birder and lately I've definitely been using the Audubon app a lot more. And I'm not just saying that because I work for Audubon, like it's actually pretty helpful. It's, um, if you want to download it, audubon.org slash app. Um, so yeah. Uh, do you want to close out with a few paragraphs from your book called A Season on the Wind? 
Um, yeah, thanks. I, I happen to have a copy right here. Um, and this is just a, a passage. Where I'm talking about the fact that these birds are migrating at night. Um, and that um, if it's a clear night, they may fly until they hit some sort of a natural stopping place like the edge of a lake or something. But then I, okay, this is near the end of the 14th chapter. Um, if rain has moved through the area between midnight and dawn, it brings a more widespread kind of magic. Migrating birds will have come down wherever they happen to encounter the storms. So they will be spread through woodlots and backyards all over the region. If people have any kind of bird feeder out, even the simplest and most casual sort, there's a good chance a rose-breasted grosbeak will find it. These chunky, flashy birds have an uncanny ability to scope out sunflower seeds. With their big beaks, oh, there's a, a beautiful picture of one in a redbud tree. Um, with their big beaks and with the big patches of black, white, and red on the males, rose-breasted grosbeaks seem to be decked out in ill-fitting clown suits. Their actions are so slow and hesitant that they don't seem like birds that could migrate to Central America and back. And yet here they are, looking around in sluggish surprise, as if they had not, as if they had not expected to get here. <laughs> because they may appear at any backyard feeder, and because they are relatively slow moving and brightly patterned, they make good ambassadors for people who are just beginning to catch the spark for birding. On a day like this, I can't imagine anything better that might happen in a person's life than for them to start paying attention to birds, to become aware of this magical world that exists all around us, totally captivating for those who know its secrets. And I should say, I mean, the rose-breasted grosbeak is an Eastern bird, but if you live out West, there's a relative called black-headed grosbeak that's also gorgeous, with brilliant burnt orange on it, uh, wonderful. So wherever you are, you know, put out a few sunflower seeds now and you might get the special visitor. Yeah, for sure. That was really beautiful, Ken. Thank you so much for sharing. I like how you refer to the gross beaks as ill-fitted clown suits. I think that's a great way to describe them. <laughs> yeah, but still beautiful. Right? Well, thank you so much, Christine. Good talking with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Good birding. Yeah, good birding to you. Mm -hmm. So now we are really lucky to bring on our next group of creatives on the show, and they're going to talk about the Audubon Mural Project. So it is my pleasure to bring on artist George Berigi and Yumi Rodriguez, um, who worked on murals for the Audubon Mural Project, as well as Audubon's VP of Content, Jenny Bogo. Thanks so much, Christine. Yeah, hello. So the first question is for you, Jenny. What exactly is the Audubon Mural Project? Ah, I'd love to tell you. So the Audubon Mural Project uh, is a public art project that Audubon started in 2014 when we published our first Birds and Climate Change Report. And we launched this with a local art gallery named the Gittler and Gallery in order to call attention to bird species that are threatened by climate change. So essentially, we enlist artists, all kinds of artists, to paint all kinds of climate threatened birds in northern Manhattan, starting in the neighborhood where John James Audubon himself once lived and is now actually buried. And it's a really pretty special experience to be walking through the city and to see birds in all of these unexpected places on bodegas, above subway entrances, on six story buildings. Um, and it's a nice reminder really that they're part of our daily lives and that birds and people need the same spaces in order to thrive. Yes, it really is. And so while we ask George our first question here, we're going to pull up some images so people can start to see what this looks like. Um, George, you had the distinction of painting the 100th mural in our series. And I'm, uh, we'll pull it up here so people can see it, but it's this really powerful image of warblers. And I'm wondering why you chose to focus on warblers for this milestone mural. Um. I mean, I think like it, we could even see just from the chat with Ken that like warblers are something that spark people right into birding first sometimes because it's, it's something that all of a sudden changes in your environment if you have shifted your focus to actually see that. And I really, I, I sort of think of birding and birding in general, but maybe like getting that interest in like spring migration and warblers is almost like a gateway drug to conservation in general because birding is so accessible to people 
there's a really low barrier of entry. And so you don't have to be, you know, you could be someone up in Harlem and think, oh, I can't get out to Yosemite or get somewhere really, you know, that we think of as nature, <laughs> but there is nature all around us. And all you have to do is sort of like shift your focus um, to pay attention to small details. And the more you start paying attention to those little details of like how these warblers are all actually different. Like once you start pinpointing these things and the more you know about something, then the more you start to care about something. And so if someone starts getting really interested in these warblers and seeing that they're coming to right where they live, they don't have to even go anywhere. They come to them. They start really paying attention to the differences and see something that's, you know, they say, oh, that's actually not a Cape May warbler. That's a Palm warbler. That's not a, you know, like all these ones that are slightly similar, but once you see the differences and the differences in habitat and where they occur in the environment, you start kind of really caring about your local environment. And it's a really good way to tie conservation into local and global. Because if you care about your warblers returning to you in New York or Ohio or wherever, you have to also care about what happens in Panama and Colombia and, and you know, the Yucatan Peninsula and these other areas. So your little habitat is connected to a global thing, you know? And so I, I just think it's a really good way to like spark interest in environmental issues that are at home and abroad, but something that is right there for you. Yeah, that's really well, well said. And beautiful work. And I love how you say that birds are, they're really just like a thread that connects us to the ecosystem, yeah. everything around us. So that's mm -hmm. very true. Yeah, they don't see borders. So, you know, in their migration, they're crossing a lot of borders and, and crossing a lot of places. And, you know, we have the, like right now is our peak migration for our warblers in New York. And I've seen so many in the last week. And, but a lot of these are going to move on from here. You know, they're not going to stay and nest here, all of them. And so you kind of also have to care about what's going on north of us and south of us, like you're connected. Exactly. Um, so Yumi, I have a question for you. You have painted two murals with Audubon. One is the Rufus Hummingbird, which I will pull up a video of in a second. And you also joined two other artists, Candace Bluarty and Melanie Sokolow, to paint the Eastern Whitporwell. So I'm curious, what was your inspiration behind picking these two birds? Sure. Um, so in many ways, I kind of feel like the Rufus Hummingbird kind of chose me. Um, it was really important for me to um, paint a hummingbird of any sort, and this was the last one that was available. So I was really, really excited about it. And the story behind it is that I grew up in Washington Heights, where I was raised by my grandparents, and where my grandfather owned and worked at several barbershops. And my grandfather has been a huge influence and anchor in the women that I am today. Um, and he was very environmentally conscious and a lover of nature. And his pet name for me growing up was a little hummingbird. Um, and so when he fell ill, I decided to paint a mural in his honor at the um, barbershop that he worked at. And in painting this mural, it was a way for me to process this, my emotions and this really big change in my life and to honor my grandfather, but also bring awareness to the world around me and all of these um, critically endangered species. Um, so y yeah, and so um, uh, in, in the Rufus Hummingbird um, mural particularly, the um, bird is not the only species that's endangered. I also incorporated um, plant species um, and insect species that are also endangered. Um, and just to name a few of them, there's the Carner Blue Butterfly, Rusty Patch Bumblebee, and um, Houston Goldenrod Plant. So I kind of wanted to bring awareness to how these things all function in unison and how we need to be mindful of them. And then, uh, so I chose the Eastern Whippoorwill also because it's like one of the birds that isn't the most attractive. <laughs> um, they're very like, they're kind of like ugly <laughs> and like brown and like they're kind of like they're nocturnal. People don't see them a lot and they have a really huge mouth. Um, it, it, when they open their mouth, it kind of swallows up the entire bird. And so um, I chose this bird because I wanted to try and paint it in a new light. Um, and, and that mural, he's surrounded by weeds and dandelions. And um, dandelions are flowers just like any other, but it's our perception of them that's different. So I really tried my best to like depict this bird in a different way so people can appreciate it. I love that story. Thank you for sharing. 
And I love that we could see your, your poem on, on the mural in that video. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, indeed. And I will say with regard to Eastern Whippoorwill, beauty may be in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> um, <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so, Yumi, a question for you, and then after you answer, George, I'd love to hear your answer as well. Um, and it's simple, but I think may take you somewhere really meaningful, which is, what do birds mean to you? Um, so, birds are, they're symbols of freedom, um, you know, for more, most people. And they're also freedom, um, um, sorry, they're also symbols uh, of hope. And, you know, that's also like in a biblical sense that most of us might be familiar with. But for me in particular with the Rufus hummingbird, um, they're kind of considered messengers from other worlds, right? They're otherworldly. They have the ability of flight, which is something that we don't have and we don't um, have experience to. And like Ken was saying earlier, they're like little miracles, you know? So um, I just like think of them as messengers of symbols of peace and freedom. Thank you. George, how about you? Um, I think it's sort of like, it, it ties into what I was saying before. I feel like to me, they are a constant reminder of, of like the connectedness. And when you, when you are really concerned about like overall environmental issues, you understand how all of them are so interconnected. Um, and, and so it's something that like you can focus on and again, like is always kind of coming into your life in different ways. Like, you might be concerned about like Florida Panthers or something, but they might not be in your, you know, in your general vicinity all the time. But these birds are, so you just are connected to them to a certain extent. And, and it just shows like, I don't know, to me, it's always like a window in, like a window into, to like larger issues and, and relating to those issues too, because there are so many different types of birds and in a way they almost show like different personalities or aspects of things. And, and especially with like spring migration and all these migration issues, I, I do always think about like our borders that we set up and what we, you know, how things are connected and, you know, we are welcoming migrants right now <laughs> of a certain <laughs> class, but we, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of like metaphors there a lot of times, so. Yeah, mm, and it's a, it's a literal window for a lot of us as we are yeah. looking at our windows right now. So it's a great metaphor. So I have a question for both George and Yumi. So are you creating any art right now because you're both artists? And if you are, then I'm curious, what role does art play for you, especially in a time like this one? And we can start with Yumi and then go to George. Sure. Um, well, right now I'm in school. I'm an art student um, among other things. But um, right now I'm playing a lot with um, animation and social media and storytelling. Um, especially in the times we're living at um, in right now, everyone's at home and they're really active on social media. They're trying to maintain connected. And, um, you know, it's like, um, I, I heard this in a film class that I was taking recently, but, um, you know, social media is really a new form of cinema. So I'm just kind of like playing with that, bringing awareness to different things, making, you know, all these kinds of cartoons and things just to keep people together and remind them how like the environment around us is so important and critical to everything we know. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, um, I, yeah, I've been making work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been making work during this whole time just because uh, it's, it's sort of one way to channel everything into and you sort of kind of have to I don't want to say have to pass the time doing something, but um, I realized that given the opportunity to watch a lot of TV, I actually don't watch a lot of TV anyway. So I sort of, I've just been working more and more. And, and I think, um, again, when you have events like this, you sort of start seeing bigger picture again. And, and that has, I think, definitely been affecting what I've been making. And I'm actually working on a piece now that I've decided I'm going to be putting in all these different birds that I've been seeing during this time period, working them into the piece too, just because it's something diaristic about, this whole time period for a lot of people's projects, I think. It's a great idea. And we're gonna share your Eastern Whipper uh, Yumi, so everyone can see that here while we- Wow, it's so beautiful. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm really grateful I had um, uh, Melanie and Candace's help. I don't know, that was a big project. <laughs> Couldn't have Is done this it the one that them. you can see from your window? 
Yeah, so this one is located right across the street from my grid. You can see it outside my window. Now uh, I'm like move my setup now. <laughs> There's a big scaffolding in the way, so it's really hard to see. But that one exists outside of my um, grandmother's window, and I put it there intentionally because after my grandfather fell ill, my grandmother would no longer leave the apartment because mm -hmm. um, she was so stricken with grief. Um, so I decided to bring nature to her. And then the other one is across the street, but diagonally. And that's where my grandfather used to work. Cool. Yumi, where are you at school? Um, I'm at Cooper Union. Oh, cool. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's a hard program. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, Jenny, uh, we've been able to show people a few visuals, but is there a way for those who are stuck at home or may not be in New York City, like most Americans, to yeah. enjoy the Audubon Mural Project as well? Yes, and I would be happy to share that with everyone. Um, if you are in New York or you're uh, passing through New York, we do have uh, printable maps and Google Maps on our website, which I'll show you. And so you can use those to navigate to the murals yourselves. New York City Audubon also runs monthly tours of the mural projects, and that's a really great way once those resume to get to better know the birds that are in the murals. So let me share my desktop. Okay, so you can see here, hopefully, the mural project page where birds meet art after dark. We say that because a lot of the murals actually are painted on uh, security gates, and so some of them can only be seen after business hours or before business hours. But there are a lot in uh, all sorts of places too. So you can see here, you can actually sponsor a mural if you're interested in that. We fund the project through contributions. That's one way to help choose species for future murals. Uh, or uh, you can choose an existing mural that hasn't yet been sponsored. There's also information here about some of the ways the project is starting to spread to other places. There's a really cool partner project in Rockford, Illinois that was started by the Mississippi Audubon chapter. And I think it's really neat to watch how uh, some other parts of the Audubon network are, are taking, adopting the murals and using that concept as a tool for outreach as well, especially about birds and climate change and also the birds that live uh, in the areas where they live. So here are the murals themselves. Here's our little ticker that shows how many species have been painted so far. And if you click into any of these murals, you can see a picture of the mural itself, as well as more information on the bird species and how they'll fare with climate change and on the artists that painted them. I'm going to open this three-toed woodpecker that was on the right because I'm so charmed by it. There we go. Um, this one was painted on the wall of a pediatrician's office. And the artist painted a Bullock's Oriole feeding, the, feeding its chicks. Uh, you can see probably the, the artist chose it for obvious reasons. Uh, also, I think, uh, is that a yellow-bellied sapsucker? There's a sapsucker there too, feeding chicks. Um, and the artist said she was really taken with the children who were being strolled into the pediatrician's office, the way they would connect with the chicks on the wall. And she said a lot of people actually also came up and offered to uh, buy her lunch and brought her a knee pad and just thanked her for creating the mural. And that reflects how I think a lot of people in the community feel about having these murals as a backdrop to their, their daily routines and their daily commutes. Sorry, that was a red-breasted sapsack. Uh, yes, yeah, red-breasted uh, sapsucker. <laughs> you can fact check me, David, on those, <laughs> my bird IDs. Okay, so we'll scroll through a few more, but we've, we enlist a lot of different artists to paint these. Some are fine arts, fine artists, others are graffiti artists. We also have had some classes, some school children uh, collaborate to create artists as well. And I want to show you, let's see. Here, um, I just want to point out, if you can see it, the Cerulean Warbler by Tom Sanford there on the right side. Tom also, some of the artists live in the neighborhood, live in New York, like Yumi and George. Others are from across the globe. Tom lives in Harlem. He loved the way that we, this project brings climate change together with the history of the neighborhood. And one thing he said, which struck me, was that he felt you'd be hard pressed to find, find five American artists that are uh, more important than John James Audubon himself. And so he was really interested in bringing John James Audubon himself back to the neighborhood in addition to the Cerulean Warbler. So you can see the Warbler there perched on his shoulder. 
And then another one, so these murals are, some of them are, you can see they're on security grade. This was, I'll show you one more. I'm just gonna click over so it doesn't take too much time loading the page. Um, this one I really love because it's a, it's a Jura Falcon and I love the way it spans a wall and an ice box. And the, some of the significance of that is, in my view, the artist, the Jura Falcon actually spends, um, most Jura Falcons spend their entire you know, season in the Arctic where it's very cold. And the climate change story of this bird too is also very interesting because climate change as things warm is only going to push it further and further north into that range. And so it's, and it's going to make it more difficult to find prey. And so it's generally going to complicate things for that bird. And you can read all about the climate change impacts too of the birds in these write-ups. And then it clicks over to Audubon's climate change to the field guide, which has those, um, the scientific models and everything that that, that science is based on. And then really terrific. Yeah. So it's all connected. And here I'm just gonna link over to this one. There's swallow-tailed kite. Yeah, so there's some that are just stunning and big and in your face. And this is one of them. It's a swallow-tailed kite that has 12 other threatened bird species kind of contained inside it. It is on the whole west side of the Stella, which is a pioneering low-income housing project um, in northern Manhattan. It's across the street from where John James Audubon is buried from the, tr the Trinity Cemetery. And this one is also interesting in that the composition of the bird itself is an homage to the, the composition of the bird in John James Audubon's original illustration. His bird is also grasping a water snake in that same way. So that was a very intentional choice on the part of that artist who is Lunar. Wonderful. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for walking our viewers through this. We will drop the link again in the comments so folks can go explore. Um, Jenny, okay. thank you for leading this terrific project for Audubon. And George, Yumi, thank you for your beautiful art, your beautiful stories. Thank you for what you're doing and our best to you and your families during the quarantine. Thanks. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. See you around. All right. Well, our next two guests have some, done something really creative and really beautiful to bring together birding and technology. So let's take a look at the trailer to introduce us to what they've built. Just going to share my screen. Oops. Or are you, are you, did, I'll, I'll share uh, and play the trailer. <laughs> Great. So sisters John B. Sriram and Dr. Kadaki Sriram co-founded Crikey, which is a mobile app development company. And you have brought the wildly popular uh, board game Wingspan to people's smartphones. Uh, so you're here with us tonight. We're thrilled to have you. Uh, welcome. And we're going to um, let you talk with us about what you're doing. So um, the trailer's gorgeous. People got a little taste of that. You've created something really special. Um, so we'd love to hear more about what you're doing and why. Thank you so much for having us. We're really excited to be here and it's been an awesome show to hear from Ken and the artists just before this. Uh, we're excited to share a little bit of our background, what our company does, and then dive into some digital birding. Um, so I'm John V. I am the CEO of Crikey, and I'll have my sister introduce herself. Hey, I'm Kateki. I'm the CTO here at Crikey. Uh, and what we do is build location-based AR games, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about augmented reality in a minute. Uh, our company has worked with the Ellen Fund to build an AR Gorilla Trek experience. Uh, we just recently worked with the Audubon Society and Stonemaier Games to do an augmented reality adaptation of the Wingspan board game. Um, and we'll dive in right away to talk about what is augmented reality. Yeah, so augmented reality allows us to see digital objects in the physical world. Uh, and this is really exciting for us for the game of Wingspan because we wanted to bring lots of different bird species right into your living room just through your phone camera. 
And so some of you might be familiar with the board game Wingspan. It was an enormous hit last year, really popular. And we found out about the board game through a New York Times article. And we actually emailed uh, Elizabeth Hargrave and the founder of Stonemaier Games expressing our gratitude and how inspired we were that it was a female board game creator and ornithologist who built this game um, and asked if we could do an adaptation of it in augmented reality. Uh, where we would build these 3D birds, uh, sort of Pixar meets Pokemon Go, and they actually agreed. And so we started to work on the project, shared it with the Audubon Society, and released it late last year. And why is this important? What do immersive experiences bring to conservation? And actually, Kaneki's entire PhD at Stanford was around this exact topic. And when we started our company together, we really wanted to promote conservation through gaming, through immersive and emerging technologies. And so I wanted Kedeki to share a little bit about her research on empathy, uh, conservation, and protecting the environment. Yeah, so a lot of research indicates that immersive experiences have a unique power to move people to action on critical issues, especially around conservation. And the reason for this is when people are able to have customized nature experiences in virtual or augmented reality, AR being with the phone and seeing a bird right in front of me, VR being with the headset, um, we actually feel empathy and a sense of connection, emotional connection to the things that we're seeing. We can also approach them as closely as we'd like without disturbing natural habitats. We can revisit endangered species again and again and have a new experience every time. And that was really the ethos behind building an AR version of Wingspan was that we wanted people to be able to collect and save their favorite birds to their bird book in the game and then be able to see them in AR whenever they'd like for as long as they'd like and as close as they'd like um, without causing any disruptions to natural ecosystems. And so what is the game? So very similar to the board game, in our version on your mobile phone, you play as an ornithologist with a goal of collecting and protecting birds in different ecosystems. Um, so because we built this with Google Maps, uh, you can actually see a map of your neighborhood and there's little pin drops of different ecosystems that you can either walk to visit or you can in our new world, uh, we have added a feature where if you tap a pin drop, we'll bring it to you in your home, in your living room. And each pin drop unlocks an augmented reality ecosystem with a different bird species. And so you can actually interact with that bird through your mobile phone camera. And these are all digital birds um, designed by an ex-Pixar artist that we've had the great good fortune of working with. Uh, and once you're into the game, uh, you can start earning badges. So if you collect a certain number of water ecosystem birds, you get a wetland scientist badge. Um, if you collect a certain number of predator birds on predator day, you get a predator badge. And there are daily challenges as well. And there's a leaderboard with top birder of the day and of the week. Um, so there's a lot of activity within the app. And we just had our first group of users cross 100 digital bird sightings, which has been quite exciting in the last few weeks. That's awesome. So anyone in who's watching us today, let us know in the comments if you've played either the board game version or the AR version, or if you want to, let us know. So we're going to walk everyone through the app in just a second. But first, I wanted to know, how did you create these stunning graphics and like lifelike birds? It's a great question. It's a hard thing to do. And as one of our users described it, it's like Pixar meets Pokemon Go. And so there's a lot of technology driving the augmented reality portion of the app, but also a lot of art that has to go into this. Um, and the board game itself is absolutely stunning with these hand-painted watercolor images on each bird card. And so we knew this was gonna be the centerpiece of the game, uh, but we couldn't, <laughs> we can't do 170 birds all at once. So we had to choose a small group of birds to launch with. So we started with Eastern Screech Owl, Cerulean Warbler, American Robin, Scissor-tailed Flycatcher, which is featured on the box of the board game, uh, Red-tailed Hawk, Anna's Hummingbird, a Mallard Duck, and a Common Yellowthroat. And why we chose these is because we had to build animated 3D models and hand paint, hand paint each bird. Um, and so by choosing these species to start with, um, we could create species categories and then start to adjust slightly for individual species. So after you make the first owl, it's easier to make the second one and the third and beyond um, from a 3D modeling and art perspective. Uh, and our whole art team has spent a lot of time researching each bird species, noting shapes and textures and behaviors. So we can um, bring those into the animation as we're breathing life into each digital bird. And the Audubon app and website has been enormously helpful in this uh, entire 3D modeling process as we've been uh, building the art for the game. Um, and each bird has its own set of animations as well. So that you, it'll walk, fly, 
um, and eat, but there's also specific ones <laughs> that are species specific for the turkey and for some of the other birds and app. One of the core features that we really wanted to retain for the, these birds was free agency. So they won't come and land on your hand. They're not going to come to you. Uh, they are wild birds. And so just as you would normally in nature, when you encounter them in the app in augmented reality, they're going to be doing their own wild free movements and you get to observe them flying around uh, using your phone. And these are just some uh, sample, this is a sample image of on the left side, the watercolor image from the board game. And then on the right side, uh, how we converted it into 3D. And we actually hand painted each feather of this, uh, of every bird as well. So they're really beautiful in app, um, trying to mirror what we saw in the board game. That's really cool. The attention yeah. to detail is just amazing. Yes, our artist almost got carpal tunnel on this one. <laughs> the hummingbirds are the hardest by far, but they're so beautiful. Exactly. So thank you for showing this to us. Now, how do our viewers get in on the fun? Well, that is a great question. Let's go digital birding. So this is the interactive portion of the experience. So if you'd like to, you can follow along at home. Um, our app is available on the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store, and you can search K-R-I-K-E-Y. Uh, or if you'd like, you can scan this QR code as well. Um, and then the image on the right is what you should see uh, if you search the app and you can download it and then follow along as we go through step by step on the slides. Um, so the first thing you do when you download the app is tap the app icon to launch the app. Um, and this is just a little video showing you how to do that. So you can find the app icon on your phone and tap it and that should open the app for you. Um, and before we actually dive into the AR experience, I wanted to just talk briefly about how can you have the best AR experience. Because this is through your phone camera, the, the best thing to remember is to stand up and have your phone up. Um, so if your phone is on your desk and the camera is facing the desk, you won't be able to see the AR experience. So you want to be able to see a little bit of your room, have some floor space in front of you. So if you do want to kneel down next to the bird or get closer to it, um, you have the space to do that and your phone is upright so the trees can grow out of your floor and we can create a whole ecosystem in your living room. In your living room. Um, so once you've got the app downloaded, you've opened it, you can position yourself like this beautifully drawn stick figure uh, to have an awesome AR experience. So now when, you, when the app is opened, you'll probably see something like this, uh, where there is a trailer playing with a bird or a gorilla, and on the bottom there's some tiles that say Wingspan and Gorilla's game. So you can tap on the wingspan tile and this is just a little video replaying what this should look like when you open your app. So once you tap on the wingspan game icon, you should see an ecosystem grow in your room and you should be able to see a bird, probably the American Robin. And I'll have Kedeki talk us through a little bit of what uh, you can do in this experience. Yeah, absolutely. So as soon as the ecosystem loads, you are free to actually walk around. And with augmented reality, these objects like the trees, the rocks, and even the birds themselves, they do get larger and uh, as you approach them. So just like as though they were in the real world, they're, they're closer and larger, further and smaller, uh, which is a very cool AR effect. You can also view and observe the bird from any angle that you'd like. Since the ecosystem is in a 360 space, your living room, you can walk around and explore freely. And then whenever you're ready to collect the bird, you will see some food token icons on the bottom of the screen. Um, there's the same five tokens as in the board game, uh, the wheat, the worm, the fish, the berry, and the mouse. So the correct food tokens will appear on the bottom and you can simply swipe up on the bottom of the screen. Um, you do need to swipe on all of the available food tokens. Once you've done that, the bird will actually fly over and eat them. Um, and when it's done, it'll fly into your bird journal and then you'll be on your way to collecting your next bird. And so if you liked that experience and you want to see more bird species, you can tap the pink login to access maps button. And that will show you a map of your neighborhood with the different pin drops and bird species so you can continue to collect in AR. Um, and the app is free to use, free to download. Um, so there's no cost to it. So you can definitely try, try it out at home. If you like the preview mode, uh, you can uh, sign in and, and see more of the experience. So what that looks like is the image on the far left. Uh, and I'll have Kenneth walk us through this slide. 
Yeah, so once you arrive inside of the game of Wingspan as a logged in user, so tapping that bright pink button that says log in to maps, once you log in, you will tap the Wingspan game tile once more, and then you end up uh, in the image at right or at left, where you'll see uh, a bunch of different pin drops on the map. Uh, the pin drop that's showing here is a water ecosystem pin drop that contains the rosate spoonbill. So to access this, you would simply just tap once on the pin drop, and then five seconds later, your camera would open up and you'd be able to collect the rosate spoonbill. Once you've collected birds, you can see them in your bird journal, which is the second image here. Um, each bird has a unique fact associated with it and a fact card, which is quite fun. Uh, there's also a user profile where you can earn special badges and compete in daily challenges uh, to continue improving your digital birding skills. And then finally, we do have a live leaderboard. Uh, as John B. mentioned earlier, people are collecting hundreds of birds, uh, especially in this current state when people can't go outside. This is a great alternative to see the birds that you know and love um, from a totally new perspective. And if you do decide to sign in and you've made a video with your AR bird, uh, please feel free to post it to social media and tag us. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Crikey app for any updates. Uh, we are re releasing new bird species every week. So we always share those um, on Instagram. Uh, and I wanted to share this photo, which we thought was quite fun. Um, David Yarnold uh, from the Audubon Society came out to San Francisco in the fall, and he had told us at the Milwaukee convention last summer that the rosette spoonbill was his favorite bird. So we actually built that and uh, took him on a walk through Chinatown in San Francisco. And this is him interacting with the spoonbill once he saw it. Uh, and it's, it was quite fun to have him out visiting. Uh, but thank you so much for having us, and, and we'd love to take any questions if folks have them as well. I see, I see there were some questions. Oh, there are. I'm going to yeah. stop screen sharing and then dive in. Okay, let's take a look. Yes, and any, anything else as well, uh, David or Christine, that you had questions? Well, thank you both. Um, we're going to do a little wrap-up segment, so maybe you can answer some questions live in the chat while we wrap up. Um, but lots of people saying that they've downloaded it while we've been talking, they played it already. You've both created something really wonderful, and I hope that our viewers and their friends and family will enjoy playing Wingspan with you. Um, you. So you can you can uh, uh, keep hearing from Jambi and Kadaki in the comments below, um, and you can download the app on the Android or Apple App Store. Um, so while they take some of your questions live in the chat, uh, I'm going to show you our last segment for you tonight. Um, so you got a chance to see the Audubon Mural Project, which is a beautiful and haunting reminder of what's on the line when we think about the impact of climate change on our communities and on the birds that we love. So last fall, I'm going to pull this up for you here, Audubon created an online tool that lets you explore the impact of climate change in your own backyard, both on the birds and on your community. Um, so if you've got a zip code you want us to look up, drop it into the comments. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a New York City zip code just to get us started while you're dropping your zip codes to us, and then we'll do a few more. So as this loads here, what you're going to see is some of the birds that live in New York that are most threatened by climate change. Um, and some of these were on the mural project that we saw a few minutes ago. So you can see that when climate change goes unchecked, which is this high scenario here, we've got a bunch of birds that are uh, vulnerable. And these are some of them, the piping plover, the scarlet tanager, one of my favorites, the wood thrush. Um, you can explore more. You can see down to the neighborhood level where birds might not be able to uh, come through anymore because of climate change. Um, lots to explore here, but I wanna make sure we get down to this one, which is also the climate change threats facing people. Uh, in New York. So here, of course, we're a coastal city, sea level rise is a big concern. Um, so these are uh, the ways that you can look at the birds and the neighborhood threats that you're facing. So uh, let's see if we've got some zip codes here. Yeah, we've got a zip code 61310. So we'll search for that. And we'll also drop the link to this tool in the comments so you can click on it and play with it yourself. Um, so this is in Lee County, which I, uh, 
Yeah, so indigo bunning is one of the birds of concern here. Red-headed woodpecker, eastern whippoorwill. We saw Yumi Rodriguez's painting of the eastern whippoorwill. Um, and then if we scroll down to the people section, um, we can see that flooding along the Ohio and Mississippi River Basin is a real challenge um, with these increased rainstorms, uh, especially in the spring, um, but other concerns as well. So uh, what we want to challenge you to do this week, if you do one thing for birds, come check out this Birds and Climate Change Visualizer, and don't just let it stop with you. Share it with three friends. You can send a quick email, you can text it, you can share it on social media. Uh, but as we heard from one of our guests, Catherine Hayhoe, a few weeks back, talking about climate change and conservation is one of the most important things we can all do. Um, so some more of you have put in zip codes. Thank you for those. In the interest of time, uh, we will stop here, but uh, we wanna challenge all of you to go check this out, look for the link in the comments, and then share it with three friends in your life today. So thank you so much for joining us for another show. We appreciate all of our guests and all that they're doing to bring birds into our lives. Um, thanks to our fabulous co-host, Christine. And we will be back with you next week for another great show. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.